Hello, good morning. Can you guys hear me? All right, thank you for coming to day, the last day <laughs> of DevNet here. So, uh, so thanks everybody for coming. This morning we have an awesome uh, executive spotlight panel. Uh, I apologize, Rob Soderbury couldn't make it. Uh, but uh, we actually have two you know, awesome execs who can even dive into to more information in different ways. <laughs> so we have Ravi Amanaganti, who's the uh, VP of switching for uh, enterprise networking. So he has lots and lots of, uh, of knowledge, kind of hands-on with, uh, with our products and how they fit into solutions. Uh, we also have John Apostolopoulos, who is the uh, VP and CTO of Enterprise Networking. So, uh, so we're actually going to start. Uh, for now, I would just like both of you to introduce yourselves. Hi, uh, I'm John Apostolopoulos, as Susie mentioned, uh, the CTO for Enterprise Networking. Uh, Enterprise Networking is a really big area within Cisco. It covers uh, uh, enterprise switching and routing and Wi-Fi wireless and IOT, uh, Internet of Things, Internet of Everything, uh, video of enterprise networks, uh, uh, some amount of analytics and so forth. So it's a really big area. And Ravi and I work very closely in a number of parts of this area. Hi, uh, I am, can you hear me? Hey guys, we have another mic here. Can you hear me now? Is the power on? Hi. Power. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I'm Ravi Amanaganti. I run all of uh, Catalyst switching for uh, enterprise. Uh, I've been doing this for the last four years. Uh, I've been in Cisco for now 17 years. Uh, so I've been across service provider, data center, and enterprise. So I've, I've seen a lot of networking. And, uh, and I'm here to talk about the DevNet. And uh, wait, so you've been in Cisco for how many years? 17 years. 17 years. And uh, our I guess rumor has it that you came into Cisco at the lowest technical level yes. and have worked your way all the way up the ladder to become a VP inside of Cisco. Yeah, so I, I joined as a grade six, I mean, this is like lowest, uh, as a grade, in, grade six engineer at Cisco. So it's, Cisco has been the only company I worked for so far. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, so lots of experience. And you know the field of networking has evolved a lot in the 17 years, so, uh, so that's fantastic. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so uh, so uh, why don't you each talk about some of the some of the products or plat or platforms that are especially relevant to developers within your roles and areas of responsibility? Uh, Ravi, why don't you start out? Yeah. So I've been I've been kind of working very closely with uh, APKM. Uh, this is one of the controller platforms we're developing to drive more value out of the network. As you probably know, there is so much we have developed over many number of years in catalyst switching to support uh, entire campus branch deployments. But as we are taking on new applications like connected buildings, uh, you know, we're trying to go for carpeted IoT. There is too many segments we're kind of trying to get the infrastructure into. And we find ourselves in a place where we haven't given too, a, a programmable platform for developers to come in and write applications to. So we have been trying to develop uh, infrastructure where we make it Rather than device centric, we are making it network centric. So a lot of information we carry in the network is, is being available to now developers above that APKM module where you can write applications to it. And that's one thing that I've been very excited about. And uh, we started actually this at around nine months ago. Uh, and within nine months, we made a lot of progress in this area. And, uh, and Ravi, while you're on that, like, what do you see as the role of developers is, you know, within your ecosystem or as, as part of your business? Yeah, so one of the things that we were trying to kind of provide uh, for the developers on this platform are that they will, the, the barrier that we had in the past where application developers who are writing uh, code to work on the network, now we, give, we remove that barrier by giving them all the APIs. Uh, and we are also trying to do that not device by device, but, but a network wide. So you, when you want to program to the network, you don't have to worry about how they are wired up on the ground. So you can just look at the very abstract level of the network and manage that as an entity. So this is something that we are, we are very serious. And we do want all the developers to participate and kind of develop that ecosystem so we can build more applications on top of it. Great. Thank you. John, can you talk about some of the developer platforms that are kind of within your scope? Sure, sure. And maybe I'll add a couple more words to what Ravi said. Because what Ravi said with APM is really, really very important. In the past, it has been incredibly difficult to actually program different network elements. Uh, different switches, different types of switches, routers, wireless access points, they all had their own version of the OS and so forth. And unless you know exactly which one was there and, and uh, uh, which bugs were there too, it was very hard. 
what, what Ravi and Tima are doing is trying to separate the, what you're trying to do from how you're doing it. Okay? And then Athic EM will take care of the how, and you can then concentrate on what you're trying to do. And then the how, and then the how will be automated. And that's pretty powerful, because that unleashes a lot of the talent to focus basically on what they're trying to accomplish, and not the details of what switch or router is there, what patches does it have, what version of the OS, and so forth. So this is a very powerful thing that Ravi and his team are, are building. Okay, any other platforms there that are under your scope that developers may want to use? Yeah, um, well, many that I'm excited about. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so another thing that's very important today is uh, location-based services. So uh, as some of you probably flew into uh, uh, San, uh, to San Francisco for Cisco Live, you got off your plane, you turned on your mobile device, you were seeing, you were automatically connected to the, to the wireless network. You could check your email and so forth. You could also then find your location via GPS. And you can also get location-based services such as Yelp to help you find restaurants, Google Maps, and so forth. We all have taken that essentially for granted now, right? Now, as soon as you come into a building, though, indoors, be it what, this building we're in here, or an airport, or a train station, or a hospital, or a retail mall, you still would like those sort of services, but in those cases, we don't have it today. So that's what we're trying to change. We're trying to, what we've built is a Wi-Fi based infrastructure that can not only easily connect you, but also can help uh, pinpoint your indoor location. So you get the blue dot on your phone to tell you where you are in this building, in the retail mall, and so forth. And then third parties can build on top of this various location based services. For example, uh, the people that own this building can help you find your way to different rooms, to the ATM machine, to where lunch is, to the bathroom, so forth. If you go to a retail mall, the retail mall can help you find the closest Starbucks, the Macy's, who has sales, and so forth. And so these, this is kind of the goal, to enable these higher level services. And the key thing we're doing here is we're providing the platform, the software platform underneath, as well as the hardware infrastructure, hardware Wi-Fi infrastructure, to enable that. So specifically, what we're doing is providing APIs to developers so they can actually very easily access the uh, uh, location information to, to give you the blue dot, also to show you the map of the, of the building you're in, also to show you what the indoor location services are, like uh, uh, to enable Starbucks or Macy's or others to very easily build these services. Uh, and all of this is done via programmatic uh, APIs where just really where talented web developers can build on top of it without having to know anything about how Wi-Fi networks work or about uh, a lot of the other complexities that we, t we, we, we hide for you and then uh, we just uh, take care of them for you. So, so we think this could be very important in, in the next few years. So uh, actually one thing is, uh, so since we have the technical audience here, uh, there's, there's a bunch of these Wi-Fi access points seem to be kind of hanging around here. Yes. Can you talk about uh, how we deploy them and a little bit about the technology that they use to get your location? Ah, uh, yes. So what happens here is that, uh, uh, so this is a very fun area. As you can see, there are quite a few wireless access points here. And the reason there are quite a few is that often there are quite a few people here and you all want really high, really great connectivity. So that's why we have this many access points. Something else I should mention of these access points now are 802.11ac. Okay, this is the newest version of, of wireless, which some of the newest phones already come, come with it built in, as well as the MacBook Pros and others. And uh, they can uh, support over a gigabit per second of wireless bandwidth to access points. So as you know, this is a big, ad big advance over what existed before. Um, now, in regard to how we use these for, uh, for determining your location, the simplest way to think about this is we're doing triangulation. Okay? We're doing some sort of triangulation where we're able to identify where each individual is based on hearing you from three different access points, three or more different access points. Uh, and that's, that's a, the simplest view of how we're actually able to, able to do it here. Now, here there's a little attachment that you can put onto it to get even better location accuracy. So, so what happens is, uh, and this is something that's still in the pipe, we're still working on it, but just like you have two ears, and you use this <laughs> for, uh, we all use them very, every day, and you're able right now to tune into me and to ignore everything that's happening around you. Basically, your two ears provide you some directional capability, right? Basically, they provide gain in certain directions, and they provide nulls in other directions. We do the same thing with the access point, because if an access point can figure out what direction you are, that's really powerful. 
And actually, if you have two access points that can figure out what direction you are, uh, you are relative to them, they can pinpoint you. And if you have only one access point on the ceiling, and it's looking down, and it knows the distance, you only need one direction, that is one access point, to figure out where you are. So these are some of the things uh, we're building to provide even uh, improved accuracy to indoor location in the near future. And by the way, there's a lot of sophistication required to get this done, Kalman filter and all kinds of other stuff. But once again, we're trying to abstract that out and provide developers the APIs. They can just call and get this accurate indoor location information, and they can use it as they wish to build the creative apps they, they come up with. Excellent. And what I'll do is later, maybe I'll pick on one or two people in the audience to talk about uh, some of the uh, capabilities that are around the CMX APIs. You ready, Matt? Okay, we'll do that a bit later. <laughs> okay, uh, so 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 Ravi, just some just some kind of deeper dives. You were talking a bit about APIC EM, and then obviously you're managing the catalyst switches, and you know APIC EM is managing many of those. Can you talk a little bit about um, kind of what's done on the devices and what's done kind of on the controller layer and how all of that works together? Yeah. So. Uh, as I, as I said, I, I've been kind of responsible for catalyst switching, and we are very used to having CCIEs manage all of this, and uh, we've got access switching, backbone, and we're managing most of the enterprises today. 70% of them are run on, it, uh, on catalyst, but they take a lot of effort from skilled resources to manage that entire hardware software stack. So what we're trying to do is we keep hardware and software separation, and we're trying to use the northbound interface for developers, but we are managing the southbound interface not device by device, but network-wide in the controller. So we are really kind of giving the view only into software and leaving the complexities of different iOS versions running on different kind of switches, different kind of layers that we already have built in, and connectivity that is already there between switches. All of that becomes completely, you know, uh, like the, the developer working on the northbound interface and Epic doesn't even know what's behind the network for him. All he gets to see is a network information database uh, where he knows the connectivity requirements between he wants to go from point A to point B or he needs uh, a particular topology to be configured, a particular zone to be configured. If I, were to if I were to configure something in this building and I want to manage this building as an entity, you will have a view, abstracted view for this building. Then you can do your application for this building. Uh, and as I said, we want to take away the, the management of the network devices, but basically more of giving that as a platform for writing applications. So APKM is exactly for that. So, uh, so Ravi, as we go to this world where there's kind of software control of the network devices, yeah. then a lot of smart stuff happens on top of the network. Yeah. Does that mean the boxes can be dumb? So, or do we, they need to have some special functions in there? Yeah. So we we believe in uh, um, boxes still being intelligent. So we believe in hybrid kind of a SDN where we run control plane on the switches, and the reason is it's for scale. If you just think about it, if I were to run the entire network as an abstract element and taking the entire control plane, this is a typical SDN you will hear from outside of Cisco, that they want separate control and data plane. But we believe in a complete stack. We want to just take the southbound interface and take away the complexity and provide a clean interface for network-wide activity, but not com completely take away control plane from the devices. So the like devices still run the control plane from a software. We also have hardware, which does a lot of uh, performance related activities, all of that happens in the hardware. But we give away only the programmatic interface into the controller. And some of the interfaces we do run, like application hosting. Uh, this is where, if you think about IoT, uh, we are trying to kind of bring third party applications into the virtualized world. So we will, we will provide a container. You can come in with an application. You can host it. We will give you the entire function that a network provides as a part of PO. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel of network but we will be able to give you that application platform and we call it, you can run IoT like data in motion. Uh, if you want to do some real time analytics on the platform, you can do that. And you can do that without having to worry about my iOS version or what devices are beneath the network. And that's the power of running both control plane and data plane in the, in the, in the system, but also providing a programmatic interface. So, so I believe in a hybrid SDN, not a pure SDN of control plane and data plane separated out. So the box are still smart. Boxes are still smart. Yes. So then if uh, kind of something happens up in the control plane or some hiccup, your packets will keep going. Yes. So packets keep going. Um, do you have examples of some of the, you know, either of you have examples of some of the types of applications that people will put, you know, closer to the devices? Yes. So uh, 
so recently we've been we've been kind of really i mean uh, the whole theme of cisco live has been internet of everything uh, and i i've been kind of uh, championing the internet of everything more in the enterprise space so internet of everything is for industries uh, for for everything that's unconnected uh, but we are still uh, my scope of internet of everything is more for people as well if you look around yourself there are probably many number of networks that are running around, around, around you this is apart from data and we want to converge all of that into into the same infrastructure so for example, light as a service. If you look around, all this fluorescent lighting is going away. They're all becoming LED lights. And we would like to kind of control all of that LED lights. If you look at all the HVAC systems that are around, which are controlling the air conditioning, or maybe the heat control, or anything that you see around which is controlled, we can bring them into the infrastructure, and we give that programmatic interface for the same network element, but all of them come with different protocols. Every single thing that you see around, they're running on different protocols. We don't want to go reinvent entire protocol gateway. We will give them this IoT platform where people can write their own management interface, their own protocol, but we will give them the network as a partner in that, in that device that we already have. So you don't have to invent the whole thing. You get the entire benefit of network without having to kind of reinvent all of that for every single protocol that you have around you. So we call that IOX, and you will hear a lot about that. And uh, there is a programmatic interface available for IOX, and light as a service is the first thing you will see in the world of solutions. Uh, we already have that developed today. Can, can you just talk a little bit more about Light as a Service? Yes, yes. Uh, so Light as a Service is, we're trying to provide uh, you know, the same connectivity uh, for lights, and we are giving them PoE through switches. Uh, we are also kind of giving them policy for switches. So if you are around here, and let's you want a different ambience around here, and we can find out your location, and we can kind of do a different lighting for you. Uh, and, and we can kind of, you know, we can control what happens to each of these lights and how we manage that, all of that with a policy, and we are also making sure that infrastructure is secure, and if the lights switch, switches go down, lights will not go down. So we, we want to make sure that the entire benefits of facilities, facility teams also take advantage of IT. Today, they have a separate team for facilities, and they have a separate team for network. So uh, entire IT and facilities are coming together, and we want to give that benefit to the developers as well. Wow, that's fascinating. Uh, and by the way, if we have any questions from the audience, feel free to jump in as well. Uh, so so uh, for our IoT platform, so we have IOX, which you guys have been talking about here, and some interesting examples for lighting as a service. And I hope we get lighting as a service in DevNet next time. Uh, so I think our hackers can, uh, can code to those. Yes. I think uh, Sam would have had a good time coding to that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, so we also have something called data in motion. So, uh, so John, I think that's on your team. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, sure. And maybe I'll take these. We'll talk a little bit about fog too, because that relates to intelligence. You, you can. Do you want to do fog first? Go ahead. Sure. <laughs> so what happens is we were asking before is, do you want from intelligence at the nodes? And Ravi gave and a description about many cases where it's really important to do that. There are also many other cases where it's important too. What happens is, uh, for example, today if you have a cell phone, as many of you do, when you do various apps, your packets go to the cloud and come back, right? Um, that's usually okay because usually you have enough bandwidth. Often the latency, which may be a half a second or so, you may be okay with, and so forth. Um, but on the other hand, if you're already doing something which is mission critical, or lives depend on it, or there are machines moving in a manufacturing plant and so forth, you don't want to take a chance that your connection to the cloud can go down, or your packet can arrive late, and so forth. Okay? So in these cases, in many of these internet of things, internet of everything application scenarios, such as uh, industrial manufacturing, such as, uh, um, for example, oil wells, which are offshore, and then we have a satellite link, which have a really small pipe compared to all the data you want to send, uh, buses and so forth. In all these different cases, what happens is you want to actually do some of the intelligence locally on the device instead of shipping all the data to the cloud. So we, we call this, uh, this kind of architectural principle FOG, and we call it FOG because basically we're taking some of the cloud and we're bringing it closer to the ground. And that's how we call it FOG. Okay. And that essentially means that we're taking compute storage and networking and analytics algorithms and moving them all closer to the places where the applications run. So as a result, you only need high bandwidth between wherever the sensors are to, to the FOG nodes, which are basically things like ISR, and, uh, Cisco's integrated services routers, and so forth, or switches. So you only need high bandwidth there, and you don't necessarily need uh, high bandwidth all the time for the cloud. And if your connection to the cloud goes down, that's okay. 
you can still do all the intelligence locally. Okay. So this is actually something that's pretty powerful, and we think it's going to be very, very important uh, in the future with Internet of Things, Internet of Everything. To make this point a little bit more clear, um, oftentimes you notice that when you, when you try to do something on your mobile phone, it could take hundreds of milliseconds or seconds to get a response, right? That is unacceptable in many sort of industrial industrial manufacturing applications and so forth. In those cases, you want sub millisecond response time. Okay, and for sub millisecond response time, you have to have that intelligence very close to the applications, and that's what we're doing. Um, and in regards then to the analytics, what happens then is, uh, of course, if you have the compute storage and networking very close to the application, you want to have the analytics there too. And data in motion is, is a, a platform we have built that runs on our switches and routers. Uh, and it's still proof of concept. We're just bringing it out now. And in so, fact, uh, you guys just brought out iOS and data in motion now for the hackathon this week. Yes, so the exactly. team's really accelerated their work to get it ready so that our coders could use it here. So thanks for that. Of course, of course. We're very excited that people are able to, to work with it here. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of people enjoyed it quite a bit. Was there a question? Yeah, we welcome questions. So. Hi. Um, can you hear me? So this is a grand vision, but the question is, is the market is ready for that? Mm. Of course, uh, light as a service I see on the Bay Bridge, right? So that's a standard example. But as a bus you are talking about, is uh, the whole um, the bus makers are ready or the transporting system is ready? Is the question. Yes. And actually, let me just say that I'll just answer the general question, and then I'll talk about the bus, because the bus is actually an easier question. This is actually a long journey. A as you know, when, uh, or, or as we learned from what say, we read in the history books, when we added electricity uh, capability to home, it took many years for that to be deployed. Same thing for telephone. Um, same thing for wired internet. Same thing for mobile devices. But it's getting faster and faster over time, uh, these deployment things. Uh, for the Internet of Things, it is a journey. It'll take uh, many decades for it to reach its full promise. But we're going to begin to see things very quickly in, in different areas, in the right application scenarios, in the right verticals where the value is, is quite clear. Buses is an interesting example. Already in San Francisco, people are deploying it. In Chicago, <coughs> people are deploying it. Uh, oh, by the way, I'm from Chicago. Um, and uh, one of the things that I, uh, I heard this from, from the lieutenant mayor of Chicago. They have it from the buses because they want to track buses and tell people so that people can see when the buses come into to the, to the local bus stop. So they know when to go outside of their, their home and so forth. By the way, the weather in Chicago is much worse than San Francisco. So there is great interest to know when that bus will be there or when it won't be there. That, that's pretty important. Another thing that happens in Chicago is that people always wonder, all right, does the mayor's, there's a lot of snow in Chicago. So people wonder, does the mayor's street get plowed before their street? So they're <laughs> interested to know where the snow plows are and how they're doing. So what happens is they've instrumented all the snow plows in Chicago and anybody can basically log in. You, you can do a Google search and check for snow plows in Chicago and you'll find it. There, there's a site that you can actually track all the snow plows and see what streets they've cleared, which they haven't, uh, and get an idea about, about what's happening there. So there are quite a few applications, and there's some surprising ones that come pretty quickly. I did not expect the snow plow. I expected the bus, but not the snow plow. Uh, <laughs> actually, that, that's interesting. Just to switch topics for a little second, is like for APKEM, since we're going to software-defined networking and we have APKEM to be uh, you know, kind of automating our networks and SDN for the enterprise. Um, you know, we talk to customers all the time, and then the customers are like, first they start out a little very cynical. So, okay, fine, what do you have? You know, I want to have, you know, different things. Okay, will it be cost effective? When is it going to happen? And then we start to show them demos. And then we show them a demo of, uh, of APIC EM, basically managing your access control, control lists, your ACLs, which is a huge pain point for operators. So. While they start out kind of pretty cynical about it, or just kind of very challenging about it, once they see that demo, they have a huge pain point with Apple's, and they say, when can I get it? Can I get that right now? Just give me that part. 
So it's the kind of thing where you know you're building out a bigger infrastructure, but if it solves a specific problem, people just kind of grab it. Yeah, I think I just want to add in. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you, if you have done networking, you should know NetFlow. Right? NetFlow is something that everybody knows. Right? But if you see how many people really leverage it to make a real-time action, probably very few. Uh, you go to the world of solutions, probably there are 100 companies trying to leverage NetFlow to give you a lot of statistics after the fact. What we would like to do is give access to that NetFlow information that's done on every device, but give it to you in a, in a, in a fashion where you can act on it, and you act on it in a real-time fashion, so you can provide much better security, much better visibility, and much better control. And if you are bringing in devices other than people who don't really, I mean, as I said, if I'm talking to uh, machines, and if a machine cannot go wrong, so, you know, and they, they are very, error, if you can't be error prone as well, and the latency is very, very important. So that's where the IOX, where we give this NetFlow platform, and all these analytics is in the switch. They are presented to you in the controller in a fashion that you can leverage, and then you can enforce any policies on the network immediately. And instead of Cisco deciding how to do that, we want to give that access to the plat developers on this platform. Yeah. That was a big thing, actually. When, uh, when Jeff Reed and the team started on APIC EM, yeah. Uh, we started interviewing network operators, and what we found is that many of the advanced features on the switches were not being used. Not being used. So very few were being used, and it's more because of the pain point of turning them on. Yeah. Um, but as we interviewed people, they wanted to have, uh, you know, when we said, well, what are your pain points? What do you want to do with your network? They said, well, we want to see what applications are going across my network. I want to be able to prioritize some over the other. It's like, well, actually, we have advanced features in your switches. Your network can do it. Your network that's out there today, really? You know, or, you know, and yeah. some, some knew and some didn't, but it was too hard to turn it on. Yeah. So things like SDN and APIC EM can actually help turn them on, or make people turn them on easily with network programmability. Yeah, and I think uh, one thing that I've, uh, and, and, you know, since I, you know, so campus switching, enterprise switching is a big business for Cisco, uh, we sell close to 130 million ports per year. 130 million ports per year. If you see in this building, I'm sure you will find thousands of switches around you. It's not easy for people to turn on features on a box by box, and that's one challenge. Second challenge, even to turn it on a box by box, it's not easy as well. So we are trying to kind of make all of that available in a fashion where people can consume it much better. And also, we don't want you to understand the network language, but I would like to give you a platform where you can provide your intent, and I convert the intent into network language and do it for you, and this is what APKM is supposed to do southbound. And the northbound is for you, which is basically the platform where you can write to. It's almost like when Java came up from Sun, you know, they, they didn't care for how you manage memory, right? You don't care for how corruption can occur in the, in the memory. You just manage your objects and leave the rest to the operating system. And networking, if you consider operating system, that's what we want to do. We want to give application interface and don't, we don't want you to worry about anything which is southbound. And, and by the way, we'll go back to IoT in a minute. But, uh, but while we're on this topic, um, you, you mentioned policy and intent. So you know, it's one thing of like configuring switches, turning on devices, providing kind of a broader control. But can you just talk a little bit more, both of you, about policy and intent? It's really a big thing of trying to get, get us to understand what that means. Like, do you have any examples? Yeah, so if you think about, uh, you know, uh, we, I kind of think about myself as a, I'm a user domain. Uh, I'm kind of bringing users onto the network. And then if I think about application domain, that's basically the data center. They are trying to kind of onboard applications, and I'm trying to bring onboard people. And now people are coming with a lot of devices. We call it BYOD, right? Everybody has a lot of devices. They need to get to applications. So as far as they are concerned, they are in a particular location trying to access an application with a particular SLA. So their intent is expressed more from this user, that application with this SLA. Should I give access, should I not give access? To me, that's business intent. So if I were to onboard people like in that fashion where every day people are changing devices, types of devices are changing, types of apps are changing. In the past, somebody has to program the application domain, somebody has to program the user domain, and then something has to stitch up. So everything works seamlessly. But the pace at which we are moving, where every day there is a new app, and every day there is a new user with a new device. So what we would like to do with an APKM on the user side, this is called an enterprise module, and then Insimi is doing the, the application center, which is more policy on the data center. And if we can give application developers to roll out applications in the compute and storage and network environment without worrying about the network, same thing on the user side. If I do that on the enterprise, routing, wireless, switching, it doesn't really matter. I'm trying to bring a user on board. 
I give you that intent and then give you that programmatic interface. And, and I kind of say, hey, you go now manage any policy for the users, you should be able to do it. I don't have to be in the, mid, in the middleman. So IT today has, I think they spend like multiple days to onboard a new user. And uh, if you were to, you know, another thing that we are thinking about is, if you go home, you want to carry your network with you. When you come back to office, because a lot of people these days are working from home, they are probably kind of on the go. How do you carry the network with you? And you don't want to provision every user at every single location. So you want to carry the intent more as a, as a, as a policy, which is kind of carries around across the network. Today you are here, tomorrow you will be in the hotel, day after tomorrow you will be back at headquarters, another day you will be in branch. I don't want to provision you as a user in each one of these places as a business entity. Instead I want to say, a user A, this is the policy, it doesn't matter where he locks in, he will get the same network. And if you do that, I think it's a huge power to the network. Huge, huge, definitely. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, so, so let me jump back, and, and that's actually fantastic because now we're talking about APKM, moving to the switching, we're talking about CMX, IoT. How does policy, like kind of in the future, how do we see it kind of spreading across these? So, so today we have each domain. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have just kind of yeah. future directions? So what happens, let, let me mention one comment too. So policy sometimes is a word that's hard to understand. Think about policy as what you want to do, okay? There's the what you want to do and the how, you, how it's actually done. And as I described before, we're, we're trying to separate the what from the how. And as Ravi said, with the northbound APIs, you try to describe the policy, the what, and then APPM actually does the how in an automated fashion. So, so that's what we're trying to do. And uh, from customers' point of view, they want this to work over all of their networks, wherever they are, which could be campus, branch, data center, WAN. Okay? And they want to be able to have a single, single ability to program across all of these. So that's what we're trying to build. Because what happens is in each of these separate domains, as Susie called it, let's say the data center domain, or the campus and branch domain, or the WAN domain, there are very different challenges that need to be overcome. Okay? So you may need specialized hardware and software to do that. But we, wanna, we want to uh, hide that all, to, to simplify it for the, for the developers, and provide an abstraction that allows them to focus on what they want to get done without having to know the details about you need these protocols in the WAN, you need these protocols for this sort of uh, access device, you need these other protocols for the data center. We want to simplify it for them so they can create one sort of uh, policy description and it can be applied everywhere from branch, campus, WAN, data center. Great, great. Okay. And in things in the future. That's part of Internet of Things. And uh, by the way, Internet of Things is around. It's like right outside the window. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so uh, so let's ch just dive back into data in motion. Mm -hmm. Can you just dive specifically into like what kinds of analytics are provided by data in motion? Sure. So what happens is I, I talked before about uh, uh, what we call FOG, which was where we were taking compute storage and networking, putting it at the edge of the network, close by where you need the application. Uh, yeah, close to the application. And uh, we also want to have analytics there. And to have the analytics there, you want analytics that can actually run in real time on the data as it's flowing from the sensors through you. Okay. Uh, it may go on to the cloud, but as it's flowing through you to the cloud, you want to be able to process it understand it in real time, and take actions. So for example, if the machine starts to break down and you need to stop it, you want to realize that immediately and take actions right away. We call it data in motion because we want to process the data while it's still in motion, okay, while it's flowing through us. Some people call this uh, real-time uh, analytics. Some people call it stream analytics. Um, we call it uh, data in motion. And we have a very small footprint uh, uh, software platform which incorpor is incorporated as part of IOX. Uh, some of you may have played with it over the last few days in the DevNet hackathon and so forth. And I think there may be some learning labs here that cover it uh, too, or at least the documentation and stuff available in all the APIs. So it's something which allows us to do very quick uh, queries and filtering the data, cleaning the data, summarizing it, um, um, and understanding it so the variety of actions we can take, we can take locally. We can also still forward all the data to the cloud where you can perform more conventional big data sort of applications uh, using Hadoop and so forth. 
So this allows you to take real-time applications locally, as well as all the conventional big data applications in the cloud, and you can do both of them. Did, uh, did you guys have some examples with video? Uh, so one of the things we were doing is looking at uh, video streams coming in, and from that identifying, for example, the number of people, identifying a different um, um, incidents occur and so forth. But what happens is it's really useful in certain cases to be able to form video analytics where you look at the video data and you try to determine if something bad is happening. Okay. Uh, and that's one of the main, one of the areas we focus on. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah, I'd just like to add in, uh, we've done this recently, we've been doing some work on this area, video surveillance cameras. If you look around, most of the video surveillance cameras are on the network. But a lot of times, the data from video surveillance cameras is gone back into the data center. Somebody is going to analyze the data. And then by the time, I mean, this is all real time, right? You can't act on it if you're analyzing in the back end. But if you had some analytics running in the machine that is closest to the surveillance camera, and today, those video surveillance cameras get PoE from a local switch. Imagine if I'm able to kind of manage some, some suspicious activity right at the switch. And if I'm connected to some sensor where I can, when I can uh, turn on some alarm, right? Something bad happens, I kind of go turn on the alarm. Immediately, there is an attention in that particular area. And you know that these are all things that can be done today with the current technologies, right? But we have not given this capability for developers. So even uh, video surveillance cameras have this application platform. I don't think it's in the DevNet zone. Uh, it's basically the same IOX concept. You can run your own application in the video surveillance cameras. You can buy from Cisco from an endpoint, but you own the application both on the management side as well as the device side. And the network will do the rest for you. Uh, so that's something very powerful since uh, uh, you know, John is talking about video surveillance, it's already there. So in that case, uh, your IoT sensor is a video camera. It's a video camera. And then the analytics is actual, the video analytics. Yeah, so I was in Whisper Suit yesterday, Home Depot came, uh, came to us, uh, and they said you know, they wanted uh, a sensor in some of the items which are very costly at Home Depot, and they wanted that to be vibration sensor, and all of that they can manage in the front store. If there is a suspicious activity, obviously for shoplifting, uh, they wanted to have, if somebody is kind of playing with it in, a, in an unusual way, and that is the data that a switch, which is sitting there locally, because all of them are sensors connected to the switch, and switch will kind of give a signal to the, to the front end of the shop, and they will, they will have somebody come in to help them out. So, so, and this is there, and, and they were trying to do it right now. So, uh, this is not a vision. Uh, you know, a lot of people are already embracing it. It's real. <laughs> Great. It's real. Um, I actually wanted to jump back to CMX for a minute. So, uh, this was not planned in advance, but we have Matt DiNapoli here in the front row. Uh, he's, he's working on the DevNet team, and he's actually been doing a lot with uh, wireless and with uh, CMX and the mobility services engine. Um, we talked a bit about the wireless technology and the locationing, you know, uh, technologies and everything there. But we actually have a set of just very concrete APIs that people have been building with that give developers capabilities. Can you talk about some of those, Matt? Yeah, actually. This one? Yep. Yeah, actually, um, it, we got a really good response, to, uh, especially in the hackathon uh, yesterday, with people working with the uh, mobility services CMX APIs. And uh, that, that was one of the ones that all of the application developers, uh, I think almost every project, uh, used. And they're, they're restful. and. Uh, they are. They've been using them uh, to build location applications directly in, inside their application. They're Put the mic a little bit closer to your mouth. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, perfect. <laughs> uh, so they were building uh, a lot of applications uh, to do heat mapping of the environment here. Um, they were building them uh, in in collaboration with uh, Jabber Technologies to do um, voice calls when someone walks in a room uh, to identify the the number for the room that they're in, and so. Uh, they're restful, and then the newest thing that's coming out is the CMX mobile application SDK <coughs> that uh, we just got out for DevNet, uh, DevNet Live at Cisco, or at Cisco Live, and uh, that SDK is, is providing uh, iOS and uh, Android developers the ability to tap into those APIs without having to worry about uh, going through step by step and figuring out, well, I need to pull the map up, well, then I need to uh, pull the location, and then I need to put the dot on the map. The SDK is abstracting that out, out all for them, and all they need to say is, pull up my maps, put my blue dot on the map. And so it's, we're making it a lot easier to tap into those technologies with the APIs and then now the, the mobile SDK. So, uh, so basically, a map is already lo loaded up into the system. 
Yes. And uh, and then so then what kind of commands do the developers use? So they, you said something about the heat map. So just what does that look like to a developer to you to generate something like that? <laughs> Um, so uh, for the developer, uh, for the mobile applications, um, the SDKs, uh, is, they're, they're still working on it, it's, it's beta right now, uh, but they are working on making it easier and so I can see qu uh, pretty quickly in the future that um, they'll put in some kind of a, a class in, in the Android application that they can just say get heat map and it'll pull up all of the devices um, in a specific area and they won't have to worry about actually plotting that information into the map. Um, they can just decide uh, how then to use that information in their application. Um, so, great. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, actually, and I'm going to pick on Sam back here. Sam, can you talk about your app that you wrote? So, uh, so, uh, so Sam in the audience here. He was in the 24-hour hackathon, and he actually his his project actually won first place there. He doesn't know I'm about to pick on him. So, uh, <laughs> so why don't you tell people about your app so and the and the APIs you use? Yes. Um, so we, we use CMX uh, for... If you can uh, put the microphone a little closer to your mouth. Yes. Thank you. Um, <laughs> we use CMX uh, in a retail environment uh, to profile where customers uh, go within the store. Uh, so we can do dynamic targeted ads uh, on point of sale uh, devices within the store, located within the store. Um, and... You know, the future of an app like that uh, for a retailer, um, <laughs> excuse me, I'm getting nervous. Sorry, I didn't, pick, yeah, I didn't tell them in advance. <laughs> what, what, what you could build on top of what, what we created is, you know, in, in a retail environment, you may have areas within the store where you want to funnel uh, your, your shoppers. And, you know, you can, you can dynamically uh, play an advertisement video or whatnot, telling telling your customer, hey, we have a sale on item X in this particular location of the store. And then on the back end, the gremlins like myself or the geeks like myself, we can take that data, like the heat maps and stuff like that, and 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 get instant feedback on is our advertisements working, and how do we dynamically. <laughs> Uh, adjust uh, the stuff, the interesting data that we're analyzing. So it's that's that's kind of that's kind of what our vision was, and we kind of built around that in 24 hours. Excellent. Which uh, can you tell them which APIs you use? Uh, so right now, right now, I know CMX needs a, a little bit of help. So we did use Things, Internet of Things. To, to assist CMX in getting a better location. So in an area, uh, let's say a toy department, we put a sensor in that environment to identify that there's actually someone there, and then we did check CMX for, for location. So we could, we could approximate that there's somebody there, and then with CMX, we know that caller based on their profile, where they've been. We can see the history. And then we can play that uh, Skylander video uh, if you have small kids and you buy those little toys Excellent. and they make a lot of money. Uh, you can play that Skylander video and convince uh, moms and dads to buy those little toys and the video game and the Xbox. Excellent. And the Wii's. <laughs> okay, thank you, Sam. And congratulations on winning yesterday. That's awesome. <laughs> thank you. And, uh, and that was, you actually had 23 hours, because I think you slept one hour. <laughs> okay, do we have questions from the audience at all? Yes. So Pablo has been our, uh, our, our, our best uh, customer here. <laughs> I do have a couple of questions. The first one is, um, from 2008, the market has been very price-centric, right? What do you believe that Cisco's main competitive advantage in the enterprise networking field. So you said that... Uh, yeah, I mean, for example, what's the key competitive advantage that Cisco has regarding, I don't know, for example, I know that you guys come from HP background, so what do you think Cisco is, you yeah. know, out, out innovating those guys? I, oh, go ahead. Sure. So uh, what happens is that our customers are having more and more complicated problems to solve, right? And what they want is they don't want box A, box B, box C, and them to try to put it together 
to solve themselves. Like, if you look at Home Depot, you look at the people who run these buildings and so forth, they need a solution. They don't want these separate things. So one of the key things that Cisco's working on is building the architectures that enable these solutions. And these are really complicated architectures because you need reliability, you need cost, uh, great uh, cost economics, and you need security. Right? And security is getting more and more important, and especially for our Internet of Things, it's critically important. And you need to have all these things working together. And that's what we're investing in, and it, it's very hard to do. We believe we can do it, and, and this is one of our key focus areas. I think just uh, adding to John, uh, the, one of the things I see Cisco kind of uh, differentiate itself is instead of discrete systems, look at the entire architecture and solution and provide business outcome for the customer. Second thing I feel is Cisco has such a purchase power when you come to networking. Uh, because of the purchase power, we actually drive the value of the network further down. If you think about Ethernet, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of used to work in the days where it used to be TDM, you know, there's ATM, there's frame. Nobody believed Ethernet will take over, but today nobody talks anything but Ethernet. And then when you go to uh, industry uh, IoT, there are a lot of, act, lot of uh, transports today, right? We believe all of that will also become IP. Now, and IP is open. So we always believed in open platform. We always believed in kind of, you know, taking the price point down. So economics-wise, Cisco is going to drive it much better than anybody else. And then if we drive solutions and business outcomes, I think we have a competitive advantage. And I, I'll, I'll add a little something as well, which is, um, you know, so, so like as, as uh, you know, we do things. So my job is like, you know, CTO of network experiences. So am I always, always trying to take a, an experience-centric approach to our technology? So I'm always trying to push simplification, like simplify. We need to simplify the experience and everything. So as I go back to our networks, I keep trying to simplify them, simplify them, simplify them. And then I know it can go all the way down to where these things are dumb and, you know, they're commoditized and that's good enough for a network. But then as you get into it, you realize networks are pretty complicated. To really run a mission-critical network that has security, that actually goes to scale, that will kind of do the things that it needs to do, then you start adding all these features back in. <laughs> and then you kind of get back to kind of where we are <laughs> in some sense. So so the thing is that, you know, there's a lot of kind of experience in that. and. Um, and as you look at you know running mission critical infrastructures and things like being inside of Cisco, what I see is there's a lot of well outside there's a lot of startups that are trying to do very kind of you know sexy SDN kinds of things like oh here's the latest thing you know just kind of do it they do the fancy pieces of it but they don't do the whole thing right they do one little thing um, but it doesn't cover like some of the existing switches that are out there, or it doesn't cover some of the like ugly, you know, <laughs> kind of uh, caretaking things that you need to do. But you know, within Cisco, as I work with all the teams who do SDN, you know, so the data center team, the enterprise networking team, the service provider teams, they actually care about making your network work and getting programmability and layering things on top. But they still really care about making sure your network works. So there's just completeness because we kind of need to stick with that. I think there's something there that's interesting. And the second question is, um, can you talk a little bit more about the transformation that your internal teams have been? Because, I don't know, for the past uh, two years, you weren't talking about IOX and APKIM and data in motion. It th means, like, this year you're talking about, can you talk about, you know, the transformation that your internal teams have had? Yeah, so, so this transformation has been going on for a long time. It's just visible probably in the, in the last one or two years to the outside world. Uh, and the reasons are simple. The world has changed quite a bit. If you think about BYOD, that trend came five years ago. IoT, even though we've been talking about IoT for 10 years, people, talk, people noticed it. People noticed it when Google bought Nest. <laughs> right. So, and, and then if you think about uh, you know everything we are doing around this area has been going in Cisco for a long time. Yeah. Programmability, yes, we had a different approach to it. Right. I mean, SDN has been around for five years, but our approach to SDN is we still want business outcomes. We want to make the network drive value. We we are not just kind of giving this control plane and hard uh, data plane separation. That's not the intent. Our goal is how does network help rest of the rest of the systems. Uh, you know, and I, I believe in that very strongly. And in my opinion, this transformation has been ongoing uh, for a very long time. And, and I think it's, it's something that we are showcasing it to the customers now. Yeah. 
John, do you have an answer for Jose as well? Yeah, so as Robbie said really well, a lot of these things have been ongoing for a while. You saw a lot of exciting things coming out now. You named a few of them. There are going to be more coming out from six months from now. And so we have a big, deep pipe of them that we're working on. So it's going to be a lot of fun. And, uh, well, and, and Jose, I'll actually mention the transformation that, that I think is biggest, which is this whole DevNet thing, right? <coughs> so is that we need to understand software developers. We need to make sure that our product teams are producing APIs, and then we're producing documentation, and having events that actually teach people about it. So the fact that we're having DevNet here, we kind of have been planning this for, for a few months now. We really thought nobody was going to come. Like we were so, I mean, this has been my biggest fear. I've been so nervous. <laughs> and the team's been working really hard to get DevNet ready. And we're like, okay, we have a beautiful space, but nobody's going to come. But as you can see back there, like the first day on Sunday, the learning labs completely filled up. We weren't even open. But I think that finally, like each of these APIs, we had like step-by-step -step tutorials that we had to work really hard to make. And, uh, and then basically they filled up and there was a waiting line. I think just people were hungry for it, but they needed it in a way that it was accessible to them, right? Because you know our folks know how to do networking like crazy. You know how to do networking like crazy. Um, but then people are newer to software. And we love that because we think it's important that we provide that and that experience is, is really important. And I know that uh, you know, what Jose's worried about is taking his whole region in Latin America, he's in Costa Rica, and making sure even the region learns about software and how to do that. So uh, this is something that we hope Cisco can help with. Thank you. Um, Adam, did you have a last question? And, uh, and Adam here is, has been really key on the APIC EM side, so he actually put together some of the first tutorials. At the last Cisco Live in Milan, I saw his tutorial on the APIC EM APIs, and then I was like, oh my gosh, that's what we need. That's what we need to say to everybody, and that's what we've uh, put into this. So go ahead, Adam. Thank you. Um, I just had a quick question around uh, Light as a Service, and you know, the amount of bandwidth that's required to power Light is relatively low light. Right. But if you think about things like, do you have a view around things like Wi-Fi and some of the future connectivity technologies and how that might sort of interconnect? Yeah, so, so if you think about some of these IoT stuff, they're not going to be bandwidth intensive. They're going to be more, you know, they bring a very different characteristics. You know, when you, when you, when you talked about voice, when we were trying to bring circuit switched voice into packet switched voice, we knew that latency and latency was more important. Uh, it wasn't a throughput because, you know, we had a lot more, uh, throughput than probably voice needed. And if you think about video, when we got video into the network, jitter probably was the most important characteristic. What is more important for IoT is it's going to be different for different kind of systems. Uh, for those of you who know about targets and incidents that happened recently, right? security is very important. If I'm giving control of my critical infrastructure lighting, I want to make sure that that is under, you know, it has got good security and also we have got good reliability, right? And you can never go down. Right? So because you know that data, you know, if your switch goes down, some other switch will pick up. But if, if your lights are connected to it, right, you're providing uh, a Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi there is another AP to pick it up, but lights, you're not going to get that. So the characteristics of these IoT are different for different industries, and, and Li-Fi is something that we're working on, and we're trying to bring those characteristics into the network as well. Okay, uh, so, so, so just the last question here. Um, so just coming back to, to Ravi and John, so, uh, so again, we have all of our DevNet folks here, people who are actually very passionate about learning to use our APIs, and you have the chance to build an ecosystem here. Um, what's their call to action? What request do you have for them? So my, my request to the team is a lot of the last 20 years, everybody thought network is more purely for connectivity. They wanted to connect from point A to point B. I believe network does a lot more than that. Network has a lot of information. If you think about, now network is in the middle of everything. <laughs> Right? We think about cloud, network is in the middle of that. Virtualization, network is in the middle of it. Since it's in the middle of it, it has a lot of data. But nobody knows how to mine that data to leverage it. So my request to all of you is learn about what data is available in the networking infrastructure, use it to provide value for applications, and then drive the entire ecosystem. And that's my, my request to the team. Wow, that's great. <laughs> John? And Ravi did a great job. And one thing I'd add is, let us know what you think. You're going to come up with many creative ideas about what can be done, what data is useful to you, what additional capabilities you. Let us know. 
and let us know what you do, and we'll try to build it in our future platforms with the right APIs and so forth to, to enable you to do creative stuff. Because especially with the Internet of Things, if, if we bring together our, our collective intelligence across the world to tackle it to make these secure, reliable, valuable systems, we can really do wonderful things. Great. Well, thank you very much, both of you, for spending your time with us this morning. Thank and, you, Susie. And thanks to all of you for uh, coming here and still working on the last day of Cisco Live. <laughs> thank you. Thank Take you. Care. Sir.